Deuteronomy chapter number four tonight. The messages that I preach on deputation are not always brand new, and if you want to judge me, it's cool. Um, but they're messages that when I was at Bethany preaching to the youth department or preaching in, in services affected my life deeply. And this one affected my life deeply. Um, I'm not, I don't want to be too long tonight, but I do want to get the message across. And I'm, I'm not a long-winded preacher. I, don't, I say that just because I want to be honest. And I'm not a super deep thinker, but I, I, I want this to be a blessing. But not only to be like a blessing and encouragement... But I also want it to be a challenge to all of us. So Deuteronomy chapter 4 is not like your typical missionary, you know, passage. But I believe the Lord has something for us. So, so right here, chapter number 1 says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. That you, keep, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes, listen to this, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord, your God, you, the Lord your God, are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land, whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them, to thy, teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Let's have a word of prayer right before we get into the message. I just want to ask the Lord for help uh, one more time. Father, we're grateful for your word. And Lord, I ask that you help me. <clears throat> Lord, give me strength. And Lord, you, you know... I have no ability within myself to do what you've called me to do, but Lord, I'm asking that you help me tonight as I open up your book, and Lord, I just want to share what I believe you have for us tonight. I ask for your help. Lord, I pray for focus to say what, only what you want me to say, and Lord, I pray that hearts are softened and prepared to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So my dad <coughs> is not a preacher, but I have heard plenty of sermons preached by my non-preaching dad. Can anybody else relate? So one of my dad's sermons is, if you're going to do something, you better do it right. Because if you don't do it right, you'll have to do it twice. That's my dad, like all the time. Another one is this, son, there's things that I don't have to do, but I do because I love you. And I'm like, okay. And now I don't get the benefit of that one anymore since I have a wife and, grand and now he has grandchildren. My, my kids get... Now listen here, Hadley Bell. There's a lot of things I don't have to do, but I do them because I love you. And I'm like, Dad, quit buying her stuff. She doesn't need any more things. You know what I mean? But one of them that has always stuck with me is this. Son, you don't have to learn lessons the hard way. You can learn them from other people. Because other people have gone to the school of hard knocks. Learn from other people. And he's told me this my entire life. You can learn something from everyone you meet. Whether it's good or bad what to do or what not to do, you can learn something from them. And that was something that he drilled into me over and over and over again. And so I try to be a super observant person. Sometimes I get in trouble from my wife because I'm a starer. And she'll be like, stop staring. We'll be at an airport and I'll stare at people. And she's like, you need to stop. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And so I, I, I try to learn from every situation, every person that I meet, <coughs> whether, it, like I said, whether it's good or bad, you know, if it's a McDonald's worker that's cranky, I'm like, hey, don't act like that. You know, you learn something from them. And so I try to learn something from everybody that I meet. But at the same time, I don't learn my lessons from other people a lot of times. I learn them for myself. And I say all of that to say this. Moses in chapter number four is preaching a sermon. He's preaching a sermon to the people of the, the Israel, the children of Israel, the people that he's been leading 
This is the second giving of the law. And the first three chapters, Moses, it's, it's like his opening illustration. And the whole introduction of his sermon is this. Remember that God did this for you. And that God did this for you. And that God did this for you. Don't forget that God did this. And don't forget that God did this. And he names all of these things. And then he gets to chapter number four. And it's like, okay, that was a really long sermon. And then Moses says, now the sermon's going to start. And he says, now therefore hearken, O Israel. Listen up. And he begins his sermon on what people call his sermon of obedience. Obedience. And so he goes, he says, Now listen, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them, this is why you should do what God has told me to tell you to do. That ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. And he says, now these commandments don't add. Look at verse number two. He says, don't add and don't take away from what God has said. And he says, now, this is, you know why you shouldn't add and why you shouldn't take away. And he says, because of verse number three. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, for the, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Now, I don't remember off the top of my head just by reading what happened at Baal Peor. But when you go back to Numbers chapter number 25, it's a super intense story. He goes and, and he reminds the people of Baal Peor, and this is what happened at Baal Peor. The Bible tells us that some of the men of Israel joined themselves to the Moabites. Now, when someone gets baptized, they're joining your church. So that's a big deal, isn't it? So the wording is on purpose. They join themselves to the Moabites. That means they're participating in the pagan worship, and all the things that go along with what the Moabites were doing. So they joined themselves, and the Bible says they committed whoredom against the Lord their God. And so they're committing adultery with the Moabites in worship and in legitimately that way as well. And so they're there and they're doing that, and all of while that is happening, Moses and the leadership, God tells Moses, gather the leadership, I apologize, and tell them what I'm about to tell you. And God says, go kill everyone that was a part of Moabite worship. Go kill them all. Now that's intense. But they go and they began to take care of all that God had said to do and take care of all the people that were participating with the Moabites. But all the while, there's a plague going all throughout the camp of Israel. And by the end of the plague, 24,000 people passed away. And the way that it ended was because a man named Phineas takes his spear, and he's at the door of the tabernacle. There's people crying everywhere, and he takes his spear, and he kills the, the Israelite man and the Moabite woman that started it all. And as soon as that happened, the plague stopped. And Moses, in verse number 3, says, You saw what happened at Baal Peor. They would have remembered. Am I right? That's an intense story. And Moses says, If you follow what God has done, and you don't add or take away from His word, and now remember what happened when you added and took away. Baal Peor happened. Everyone that did that, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Verse number 4, it says this, But ye that did cleave, you that drew nigh, that got close unto God, the Lord your God, are alive every one of you this day. And then he says, verse number 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land, whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and then they'll say this, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is, in all things that we call upon Him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all the law which I set before you this day? So in essence, the first eight verses of chapter, of chapter number four, Moses is saying this, I've taught you what God has wanted me to teach you. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Remember what happened when, we did, when you did add or take away. But also remember, those of you that didn't, you're alive. You're still alive today. And then he says this, if you follow the law of God and you follow what God has said, and he's talking about these first five books of the Bible, he's saying if you follow these things, 
They're your wisdom and they're your understanding. You may feel like you were in slavery and now you've been wandering in the wilderness for years on years on years and you have no life experience outside of doing what Egyptians said and walking in the desert. You may feel like you have no wisdom or understanding, but if you follow what this book says, you'll be wise and you'll be understanding. So much so the nations around will say, wow, look, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And then he says this in verse number seven and number eight. All the false gods out there, they're far away. But we have God close to us, and we can cleave unto Him. And then we get to verse number 9. And this is really where a lot of the message is going to come from. He says, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently. Now, this needs to be unpacked a little bit, because it's, it's a, um, there's more to it than just what it sounds like. And so when you begin to read chapter or verse number 9, the word heed and keep are actually the same word in the Hebrew. So only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. So when you look those up, the word is this, to protect, guard, or attend to. Protect, guard, or attend to. Now, only take heed. So only protect, guard, or attend to yourself and your soul. And then the word diligently... It's very interesting, and when you look at it, and you go into your Strong's Concordance, and then you check it three times to make sure you didn't read it wrong, the base idea of this is right here, is to turn or gather embers. Now, I like fire. Anybody else like fire? Good. Anybody like to burn things for no reason? I like to burn things for no reason. And so, I actually brought my favorite fire tool this, tonight, and I travel with this. Yes, it's right here. This is my fire poker. When we bought our house in Lubbock, uh, you know how you have a list of, like, this is what you have to have in your house? You know what I'm talking about? Mine was, you have to have a fireplace. Now, it's because I didn't grow up with a fireplace, and I have no knowledge of fireplaces. You'll find out from this story. <laughs> but I wanted a fireplace. My wife had a whole other list, and it was way more important than mine, but we did get a fireplace. And so, and I did point at her with this. <laughs> So the first snow day in Lubbock, we, I was like, we didn't have kids yet, so we had all the time in the world. And I told my wife, I was like, let's get a fire ripping. And she was like, okay, cool. Because when it snows in Lubbock, I don't know if it is that way in Georgia, but if it snows an inch, everything shuts down for a day. If it snows four inches, everything shuts down for at least four days, right? Are you following me here? So I think it snowed about eight to ten inches, really random for Lubbock, Texas. And it was awesome because it was like, sweet, we're having a snow day. So we went to the grocery store, and I don't know if it's this way in Georgia, but where we're from, the grocery store has no milk, no bread, no eggs, like all the things that you think are essential, but you're like, what are you doing with all that bread, you know? And so, so uh, we went to the store, grabbed a bunch of junk food because there's no healthy stuff there, and if there was, we didn't look for it. And um, so we went, and, and we started to, to make a fire, right? And so we're at my fireplace, and I'm like, man, let's get a fire ripping. We'll watch a movie or something. Like I said, we had kids and had all the time in the world. So my wife's in the kitchen, and our, the way our house is set up, you can see the kitchen from the living room. And so I'm trying to get this fire going, and we have like a stack of thrifty nickels. Thrifty nickels are pretty much free newspapers that pretty much, you're supposed to take one, but for youth activity, I took like this many. So I don't know if that's thievery or not. If it is, sorry. So I took this stack of thrifty nickels, and I mean, I'm burning through thrifty nickels like, like crazy, burning fast. And I cannot get this fire going. And I'm getting upset because I'm a man and I'm proud. And I think I should be able to start a fire. But I've never started a fire the right way. I've used chemicals, you know. So anyway, so I'm trying to start this fire. I'm trying to start this fire. trying to start this fire. But my wife, like I said, has been spiritual her whole life. And so she's a meek and quiet woman. And she says, hey, babe, would you like me to help? And I'm like, sure, whatever. So she comes over there and she looks at it. And she goes, hey, can you go get some kindling? And I look at her and I'm like, what is kindling? Now, time out. My wife grew up in the Northwest, and her house was heated by a wood stove her entire life. The whole house, wood stove. So she knows how to make a fire. And I'm like, what's kindling? So she tells me what kindling is. And so I go outside, and, you know, I got a dumb dog, and so he's jumping all over me. And I get some kindling. I bring it in. And she, so she puts it underneath everything, and she takes a thrifty nickel. And I'm like, I already tried that. And she's like, oh, well, you know, she's nice. So she lights this kindling on fire, and then she begins to work that fire a little bit, and I'm seeing flames, and I'm kind of upset, but also kind of happy, because now we have a fire. 
And she gets this fire ripping. And I'm like, sweet. Now, I like my fire so hot that I feel like a hot dog at 7-Eleven. You know what I mean? Like, like where your face is baking, you know? And like, you're like, do I still have eyebrows? You're checking, you know? So I like my fires that hot. So my wife, she gets it going. But then I'm like, throw the wood on, you know? And it's crazy. Well, come to find out, you can't just leave a fire burning in your living room and go to sleep because you, w- you could wake up dead. So we have to stay up like three or four hours later than we should have. But we didn't have kids, so it was okay. Well, the next morning, we come out, and like I said, it's Lubbock, so everything's still shut down. I'm not going to work. The schools are not going, so we're staying home. And I'm like, hey, let's start a fire again. And she's like, yeah, sure. So, she, so I'm like, okay, I'll go get some kindling. She's like, no, 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 you don't need any kindling. And I'm like, Callie. You have to have kindling to start a fire. Like I know, you know what I mean? And so, so I, she's like, no, go get some logs. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I get some logs and I put them in there and I'm like, you told me not to do this. And she's like, hand me that thing. And I'm like, okay, I like this. So she takes it and she begins to poke underneath the logs that we just put in there. And all of a sudden, it's not just gray ash anymore, but it's glowing red. And I'm like, what kind of voodoo did you just do? And so it begins to glow red, and we've been asleep. We didn't have kids, so probably at least eight hours. And so there's, it begins to glow red because she stirred it around. And then she did what is my favorite thing in the world to do with fires and my favorite noise. She blew on it. So she, she turned those embers underneath, and then she went, and it goes, instant fire. I'm like, you're a cheater. I don't know how it just happened, but that is absolutely amazing. And so now we have this fire. And it took that long in comparison to my hour and a half effort the night before. But the idea of the word diligently is that. To gather those coals together, and then now follow me here, to gather those coals together, to poke at, to stir those around, to turn that fire because it will reignite. But then go back and it says only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently to protect, guard, or attend to yourself and your soul. The word is diligently. And so the idea to this is that here, you need to protect, guard, or attend to the fire. Listen, the fire that the mighty acts of God has done in your life. Because remember the first three chapters. Remember God did this. Remember God did that. Remember God did that. And so he's saying, protect, guard, and attend to the fire within like a fire that's going to keep you alive in the winter. Now why? Look at the verse here with me. I'm going to walk over to the steps. Verse number 9. Protect, guard, and attend to your soul, yourself and your soul diligently. Here's why. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. Now, time out. I'm going to bring this down here with me because I want to stand down there. But he's saying this. Lest thou forget the things that your eyes have seen. Now, we have to think, okay, what did the Israelites see up to this point in their history? What had they seen? Are you you following me here? Okay, so when they were in Egypt, they were slaves. Moses goes to Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, no, no. And then what happened? The plagues, right? Right? And they saw these incredible plagues. I'm not going to name them all. But Egypt is a dusty place. And it said the dust of the ground became lice. Listen, I've had thin hair my whole life. And it's thinner now than ever before. I've never had lice, but it sounds itchy. You know what I mean? It sounds awful. The water turned into blood. And then my favorite plague of all, the frogs. I mean, can you imagine a divine judgment by frogs? I hate frogs. They're loud, they're obnoxious. When you're not used to them and they're out in a pond, I'm not saying that they're out in that pond. Praise God. But if they were, I wouldn't be able to sleep because frogs are annoying. Can you imagine the frogs? And then Moses says, when do you want the frogs to go away? And Pharaoh's a dummy. And he says, tomorrow. So one more night with the frogs and then they all died. And they didn't just disappear. The Bible says they gathered them up in heaps and they stinketh. That's nasty. So how could he says, don't forget the plagues. Well, then they get released from Egypt and they get to the Red Sea and they start yelling at Moses. You brought us out here to die. Moses walks up to the Red Sea. God says, put your hands in the air. And the Red Sea parts. They saw the Red Sea part and God and, and Moses is saying, don't forget. 
Are you following me here? And then they went into the desert, the, the, the wilderness wanderings. And what happened? Tons of miracles. Tons of miracles. They walked on the same shoes for 40 years and they didn't wear out. We've been on the road for four months and I feel like I've bought shoes everywhere we've gone for my children. It's ridiculous. But also, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They got thirsty and so what happened? Moses hit a rock and water came out. They got hungry and manna fell from the sky. They got sick of the manna and God said, you want me? I'll give you quail. And the Bible says until it comes out your nostrils. Have you ever eaten quail? It's a waste of time. It's a mini chicken nugget. It's like, it's so tiny. Can you imagine so much quail for millions of people? It's coming out their nostrils. It's ridiculous. But they had quail. Then they had water from the rock again. And over and over and over, they saw God work, and they saw God work, and you can go through the miracles all forever. I mean, they saw, the, they saw some of the sons of Korah be swallowed up by the earth. How could you forget? But also verse number 3 says, Bill Pure. Look at this verse number 9 with me. And it says this, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. And then verse number 10, Moses says, Especially, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they, listen to this, may teach their children. And ye came near, and you stood under the mount, mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake, and the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Listen to this right here. Ye heard the voice of the words. But saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he, this is, and God, this is what it says, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Moses was reminding them to not forget when they heard the very voice of God give them the ten commandments. How could you forget? Right? How could you forget that? But when you read the rest of the Old Testament, they forgot. You read Judges, and some people say that the book of Judges is the darkest time of history for the Israelites. Because it, everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And they forgot the mighty acts of God. You see, when God did a mighty act in the life of an Israelite, it was like wood to a fire. It was like wood to the fire. And I want you to follow the illustration here because when wood goes on a fire, it makes the fire last longer and burn hotter, right? And after all of the wood had been gathered and put onto the Israelites' fireplace, we can say it that way, they didn't do what verse number 9 said. They didn't turn their fire and so they forgot. And now when I read the Bible and I'm studying for sermons, it's hard for me not to think about myself, about England, about our own nation. And so whenever I begin to think about England, they forgot as well. God did amazing things in England. I mean amazing things. And not only did he do them in England, but he did them through England and sent missionaries all around the world. All around the world. But the British people have forgot. They have. And then I think about our own nation. And God has done some absolute miracles in our own nation. And I'd venture to say we're in the very midst of forgetting now, the interesting thing about this passage is verse number 8, 1 through 8, is all about the nation. But verse number 9 is the solution for the, for the nation. And it's this, individual remembrance. Because verse number 9 is a hard transition from follow this as a nation 
But only take heed to yourself and to your soul diligently. Lest you forget. And so, though Israel forgot, and though England has forgot, and honestly, though America is forgetting, the solution is individual remembrance. But what do we have to remember? Well, where's the wood? Right? What pieces of wood has he added to your fire? What is something that maybe, and I know we just came through Thanksgiving. It's a time of remembrance and, thanks, and thankfulness, Thanksgiving, right? But sometimes we can just save that up for the end of November. But if we want to see God do a mighty work, and as verse number 9 says, if we want to pass on what we've received and teach it to our sons and our sons' sons, You have to be diligent. And you have to worry about yourself and your soul like a fire that's going to keep you alive. Because here's what happened to the Israelites is they forgot. And so they lacked the desire to obey God because they forgot the mighty acts that He had done in their hearts and in their lives. They, didn't, they no longer wanted to follow after Him because they saw the other nations and they said, our God has never done anything like their king does for them. But when they see the other kings and they see the other nations, it's, it seems as if when you look at, look, the, the grass is always greener on the other side, it seems to be. And so when they began to look at what the other nations had, they said, we've never had anything like that. But the other nations, it says this in verses number 6, 7, and 8, the other nations looked at the Israelites and said, we've never had anything like they have. And the Israelites were looking at the other side and they were saying, look at what they can do and how they can live and what they can do. And God said, don't do those things. And here's why you heard the voice of God tell you, thou shalt and thou shalt not. But they forgot. And so God, all through those years and all through that time of history for the Israelites, He had add, added firewood to their fire and added wood and added wood and added wood and the fire was hot. I mean, it was burning and they were going into, into the, Canaan, the Canaan land. They crossed over Jordan with Joshua. They were winning battle after battle after battle after battle. Then they got a little haughty and they lost one and then they kept winning again and again and again. And then when Joshua died, they forgot. And it's like the fire went cold. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I have seen the greatest miracle of all if you're saved this evening. He's taken a sinner and forgiven you of all your sins, wrapped you in a robe of righteousness, and made you a child of the King. That is amazing. That's like a fire starter. And it's amazing that when you get saved, how exciting it is. And when you begin to obey God and do what He says and do what He says and do what He says, it's like He takes firewood and He puts it on your fire and He puts it on your fire and it makes you want to do more and more and more for Him, right? But somewhere along the way, we can lose the desire to be obedient because we forget. And the solution for national forgetfulness is individual remembrance. But you have to turn your fire to keep the desire to be obedient. You have to turn the fire of God's mighty acts in your life over and over and over and over again. Because the more you turn a fire and you put more wood and more wood and more wood on this fire, the hotter and the hotter and the hotter it's going to burn. But here's the amazing thing, is when your fire is burning hot, it's like people go, you're pretty wise and understanding. And they look at your life, and they wonder what's different. Are you following me here? I know it's an Old Testament passage, I understand. But I think it has a church age application. And, you look, and people will look and they'll say, okay, I've been going to church my whole life, but something's different about you. Something's different about what you've got going on. And you know what you do? You take a piece of firewood and you say, look at what God has done. And you set that one down. You pick up another one and you say, hey, look what God has done. 
And you set that one down, and you take out a fire poker, whatever it is. I, I wouldn't recommend carrying this around. I always hope I don't get pulled over and then searched for whatever reason, because this is going to look pretty guilty, you know what I mean? <laughs> but whatever your fire poker is, whether it's a pin, whether it's a prayer, whether it's something that you hang up on your wall, whether it's a box that you drop something in, I don't know what, I don't know what's going to help you. But if you've lacked the desire lately to obey God in whatever command that He's given, if you lack the desire to obey Him, you need to turn your fire. And it's amazing tonight, we have the chance to pray. Pray for a brother in France. I always love hearing about European missionaries. And I praise the Lord for them. And it's exciting when someone is willing and able to take over a work and hand it off to somebody. It's exciting. But maybe during the prayer time tonight, you need to take a little bit of time and, and maybe just turn a fire a little bit. And, and when we turn our fire, it can't be of remembrance where we go back in the good old days. It can't be that kind of turn. But it's got to be like a, a turn, a productive one. One where you turn your fire and it starts to burn hot and you're like, okay, i got to go get some more wood. You, are you following me here? And so as a missionary, this is what we want to do. We want to go around and tell you about the mighty acts that God has done in our life. And he's provided so much. Four months on deputation and 25% of the way through. Praise God. I mean, seriously. Seriously. Praise Jesus. And, and I can tell you story after story after story. We were in Nebraska, a tiny little town in Nebraska, and our car had this random issue, and a dude fixed it for free in five minutes. How does that even work? I can't even tell you. I, I, it's a miracle. And over and over and over. And I can tell you about kids in Lubbock, Texas that needed to get saved, and they finally did, and praise God it happened. And then they needed to get baptized, and then I got to dunk them and hold them under a little bit because, you know, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you follow me? I can, tell you, I can tell you story after story after story. And you know what those stories make me want to do? They make me want to do more for my God. And if, if Emmanuel Baptist Church will just get a, 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 an attitude of remembrance and that fire will start to burn, people are going to start going, something's different about that place over there. Something's different about those people. Something's going on that I have not seen. And you begin to turn your fire, and it gives you the desire to be obedient to God. Because He's done mighty acts in all of our lives. But we're pretty quick to forget. Kind of like learning lessons the hard way. You know what I mean? I forgot a lot of lessons that my dad taught me. And then when I have to learn them the hard way, I'm like, man, you know? Well, the lesson tonight is this. Don't forget what God has done, because he's done a lot. And when you remember, it makes you want to do more for him. It makes you want to obey him. And when you want to obey and do things for him, people begin to notice, and they go, your fire's burning pretty hot. I want that warmth follow me? It's a simple message tonight. And I just challenge you during the prayer time. Take some time. Pray for the missionary in France. But remember what God has done in your life, your church's life, your family's life. Remind each other because it's encouraging.